<laughs> so anyway, I'm going to be moving on to the, to the next speaker now. Um, so we have Mr. Dan Johnson. So in terms of Daniel Johnson, he's the founder of three national no non-profit organizations. So at the age of 18, he founded People Against the NDAA, so which became one of the largest civil liberties organizations in America. So Dan Johnson is now the executive director of We Do Better. So it's an organization that is dedicated to allowing the people to direct our money to the organizations that are serving human needs better than the government and highlighting those organizations that achieve that standard. So please, um, can you help me put a warm welcome for Daniel Johnson? Thank you very much. All right, can anyone hear me? Fantastic. How are you guys all doing this afternoon? Oh, come on. How are you guys all doing this afternoon? Much better. I know there's 12 of you, but good job. Um, so uh, what you see at this blockchain conference today uh, and wh who you have around you are not the people who want to make it rich in cryptocurrency, though many of you may want to. Uh, they're not the people who uh, got in and decided, well, I can just increase my assets and they only know what a Bitcoin is. The people you have around you today at this conference, small as it might be, are people who are looking at blockchain as a way to transform industry, as a way to transform the world as we know it, and as a way, particularly in our case, to meet human needs directly. And uh, the question I want to ask is, uh, what was it, why was blockchain invented? What was the biggest reason behind blockchain? Well, for hundreds of years, we have used a official stamp from a government to indicate that something is true or valid or trustworthy. Uh, but over time, we realized that government may not all be, be all that trustworthy. And maybe a stamp or maybe a official document didn't quite mean what we thought it meant. And we started looking for other solutions and we started looking for other possibilities. And that is the biggest hole that blockchain filled. Because think about it. If uh, we had uh, just decided that uh, our existing systems worked for trust, then why wouldn't we give uh, all of our regulation and all of our trust over to government agencies? Why wouldn't we have them run everything? Um, they are where we get our official stamps today. Well, it's not just in trust that maybe the government isn't the best way to provide for. It's also in meeting human needs. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about not just what happens when you ask a government to meet human needs in this country and around the world, but also what happens when the people are able to meet those needs directly. Let's get started. So the, this one doesn't work, it doesn't appear. Um, all right. All right, let's get started. So uh, what is the state of America today? How well is our country addressing poverty, for example? Well, right now, one in five American children are living in poverty. Uh, that is 19.7% of the people living in poverty are under the age of 18. Um, and uh, right now, 13.5% of Americans live in poverty. Um, this right here is the hallmark of our anti-poverty system in the United States. This is the temporary assistance for needy families system. Well, only one quarter of the money that you pay in to temporary assistance for needy families, just writing a check to people who need it, actually ends up in the hands of those welfare recipients. That is a 74% overhead. What about food security? An estimate 12.7% of American households are food insecure at least sometime in the year 2015. Education, we have tripled our education spending. And where are we worldwide? The global education ratings of the United States are 24th in literacy, 25th in science, 40th in math, and 14th in education. And we spend almost more on our education than nearly every other country in the world. Uh, what about national defense? Well, a recent study by the Defense Business Board found that simply because of extra bureaucracy, the Department of Defense wasted $125 billion from 2010 to 2014. That's billion with a B. 
This could hire over 2.25 million new teachers, reduce class sizes by 29%, or pay all medical expenses for 12.5 million people. What about veterans care? According to the VA Inspector General, 307,000 veterans died awaiting veterans affairs care between 2011 or between 2001 and 2012. Uh, healthcare, this number right here is not deaths caused by, uh, because medicines that the FDA did not approve did not make it to market. Uh, and they couldn't save people. This is deaths caused by FDA-approved medical devices and medicines. Since 9-11, 865,184, actually since 2005. Um, who in here does not know what Medicare is? Anybody? No? Okay. Well, uh, just in case you didn't, every single year Medicare spends $100 billion promoting Medicare. Um, what about homelessness? 600,000 people on average uh, were homeless on any given night in the United States. Uh, what about infrastructure? Does anybody remember uh, what this bridge was? Anyone want to shout it out? Florida. This is the bridge at Florida International University. It was a brand new passenger bridge that unfortunately collapsed uh, and killed a few people and injured several others. Um, does anyone happen to know uh, who was warned before this bridge collapsed? An engineer working on the bridge called the Florida Department of Transportation and said, I don't believe the bridge is stable. This was two to three days before this bridge collapsed. Uh, and the reason why uh, he was not responded to, it went to voicemail and all of the employees were out of the office. This is not just a Florida bridge situation. 50% of all U.S. roads are in moderate or poor condition, according to the U.S. Department of Transportation, and 25% of our bridges are structurally deficient and or obsolete. What about the environment? Has anybody ever heard of Flint, Michigan? A few of you? Okay. Well, in Flint, Michigan, they're still dealing with an environmental crisis, and if you look at an organization called Water Defense, the water in Flint, Michigan is still not safe to drink, regardless of what the government may or may not have said. And this is an astonishing number that 43% of Americans cannot afford the basic needs of a middle-class lifestyle in the United States today. I could say, almost matter-of-factly, that in the United States today, we can indeed do better. So why is it? Why is it that this is where our country is right now? Well, we've identified eight fundamental flaws that happen when you ask government to deliver a public service or to address a human need. I'm not saying they should, I'm not saying they shouldn't. Let's just ask what happens when they do. Number one, government is the only institution where resources don't follow results. Big claim. What about uh, your lawn boy? If uh, a guy, uh, you, you have a boy uh, who's paying for summer camp, who mows your lawn, and he doesn't do a good job, what is it uh, that uh, you can do? Can you stop paying him uh, next time and not pay for his services? What about a nonprofit? If you donate to a nonprofit and that nonprofit does not put the money where it belongs, can uh, you stop donating to that nonprofit? Okay, well, what about a massive corporation like FedEx? If, if you ship packages with FedEx and say they get to the hotel three or four or five days late, can you stop using FedEx? Now, this may not have, uh, you know, you, may, you not using FedEx, they may not call a board meeting together and go, oh my God, Dan stopped using FedEx, what do we do? But you yourself can have a measurable impact on their bottom line without getting other people involved. Government is the only institution where that is not the case. And that's because they have guaranteed perpetual revenue. Uh, let's say that you walk into a restaurant one day and you find a fly in your soup. And you go to the waiter and you're like, waiter, there's a fly in my soup. And uh, the waiter's like, well, I'm, I'm really sorry that there's a fly in your soup. Let's fix that right away, sir. I'll get you another soup. And you're like, no, I, I want a refund. That's enough. I no more flies in my soup. I want a refund. And the waiter's response is, I'm sorry, sir. Not only do you not get a refund, but you have to come back again next week and get the exact same soup. That is guaranteed perpetual revenue. Massive concentration of money and power. Politicians are disliked more than cockroaches, traffic jams, and Nickelback. Now, I like Nickelback, so don't hate on me, but 
um, whose idea was it to give them this amount of power? You want to know why there are so many lobbyists in Washington today? Because if you divide the federal budget by 535, you're looking at $7.1 billion per member of Congress. Members of Congress have a staff of about 14 or so. Um, does anyone know of a $7.1 billion company that has a staff of 14? <laughs> it doesn't exist. And you're, even if you like these members of Congress, even if you think they're great people, what human being could possibly choose where to spend those dollars efficiently and effectively with that much money and with that little bit of staff and resources to do so? It's a massive concentration of money and power. Now, uh, given that you guys probably all got up early this morning, um, given the conference started at 9 a.m., uh, let me propose a horrifying scenario for you. Let's say that one day the Department of Motor Vehicles takes over Starbucks. Uh, and they decide to call it the Department of Caffeinated Beverage Distribution. Now, uh, what do you get when you go to Starbucks? You get service with a smile, you get colorful uniforms, they might even call you by name, even if they misspell it on the cup. Um, they, uh, you know, put you, gave you hot coffee. Um, but what would happen at the Department of Caffeinated Beverages? Well, you come in, you grab a number, uh, you get to wait in line. Your choices are uh, lukewarm coffee, cold coffee, and really cold coffee. Um, and uh, at the end of all of this, they take a picture of you that looks like you're drunk and or high. It disincentivizes quality and social services. Why? Because when you go to Starbucks, you know that if they don't give me good coffee or good service, I can go to Dunkin' Donuts. But if you go to the Department of Motors v Motor Vehicles, where else can you go? Number five. Spending isn't responsive to real-world outcomes. Uh, does anyone recognize this picture? And remember when United Airlines dragged a customer out of their seat on the plane. What happened to United Airlines stock the next day? United Airlines stock lost $255 million, and that was after recovering. Um, so what happened? When United Airlines lost a little bit of stock, you know, what, what, what big deal? Well. United Airlines announced 10 policy changes, including limiting law enforcement to security issues only, Delta increased their max compensation offer, American Airlines created a new policy, Southwest Airlines created a new policy. This is like, uh, has anyone ever seen one of those videos? This reminds me of a video uh, where maybe a, a police officer didn't treat a citizen uh, the best in the past few years, okay? This would be like that video goes viral and every police department in the state changes their policies. But government agencies are not responsive to real-world outcomes. Number six, increases waste. What creates downward pressure on waste? Anyone? What creates downward pressure on waste is you might have to spend that money somewhere else. Opportunity cost, exactly. That if uh, I buy this $100 steak dinner, I might not be, be able to spend those $100 on advertising to get people to come into my business or my nonprofit. Well, uh, what happens with government agencies? According to Jeffrey B. Liebman, the National Bureau of Economic Research, 2% of spending would occur in each week on average. This is reasonable. 52 weeks in a year, 2% of spending. We find that 8.7% of spending occurs in the last week of the year, nearly five times the rest of the year weekly average, because that is the week before the paychecks come in, regardless of your results. Number seven, does anybody in here know a veteran? Does anybody in here know a veteran who would recommend they go to the VA? <laughs> okay, but many of you may not know how long the Department of Veterans Administration has been this bad. 1945, VA Administrator Frank Hines resigns. 47, 55, 74, 84, 95, 2014. The exact same problems of long wait times, of scandals, of massive waste, of poor care have been plaguing the VA for a long time, and maybe it's because people don't know about it. Maybe it's because people are not aware the VA is a problem. Well, uh, according to a Gallup poll, 89% of people agree that you should allow veterans to get health care at any health care provider that accepts Medicare, not just the Veterans Administration, and 67% agree spend more federal money to modernize the VA. The first one has not happened, regardless of the public input. So this is a question is, is this a broader problem? Uh, well, Princeton University did a study in 2014 and they asked the simple question, does the government represent the people? And here's what they found. I'm just gonna quote this study directly. 
the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. Thank you very much for voting. And number eight, and perhaps one of the most important problems when it comes to meeting human needs, is it makes us less likely to act on our compassion. Why? Two reasons. Number one, they took my taxes. Um, so if I walk up to you, I can't, the stage is fairly tall, but if I walk up to you right now and I take your glasses off your head and I say, hey, sir, I know you really like your glasses, but uh, this person really needs them more. And they, you know, they need them, they'll correct their vision, etc. Are you likely to give me another pair of glasses? No? Um, they, uh, five minutes? Okay. Are you likely to give me another pair of glasses? Probably not. Um, if uh, you force me to help you, I am very much less likely to help you. The homeless will be taken care of. Um, number two is the homeless will be taken care of, which is, uh, I have already paid my taxes. Why would I do more? I have done my job. I've done my part. Now, I need to move quickly into a couple examples of organizations that do better. Anyone in here ever heard of the Cajun Navy? Okay. Hurricane Harvey dumped seven trillion or two trillion gallons of water on Texas. The Coast Guard was activated. They saved 4,500 people. That is very commendable, but they have a $7.6 billion budget. The Cajun Navy, a ragtag group of informal men and women who took their boats, GPS, and walkie-talkies, activated two days before the National Guard, and they saved 6,000 on gas money. What are some other examples? Um, you can look at Georgia Works. We have homeless, a homeless problem in this country. And if you look at Georgia Works, uh, in comparison to the Workforce Reinvestment Act, where 34% of Americans participated and actually got a job and kept the job for six months, Georgia Works has a 100% job acquisition rate and an 80% job retention rate after six months, and they only deal with homeless men off the streets. Uh, what about healthcare? Uh, is anyone here familiar with uh, uh, healthcare co-ops? Okay. Christian Healthcare Ministry is the longest ser uh, uh, serving healthcare sharing ministry in the United States. 279,000 members, and they've covered over a billion dollars in medical bills since 1981. Their plans cost approximately half the price of Affordable Care Act plans. And there are many examples in blockchain as well, since I won't be able to go through many of the other ones. Unsung. Is anyone in here familiar with Unsung? Blockchain decentralizes the meeting of human needs in a way that you can be accountable for what you do. And with Unsung, it connects restaurant owners or people who have extra food, grocery store owners who have extra food, with the actual people who need the food without having to go through another organization like a food bank or like something else. Um, power Ledger. Uh, one of the biggest centralized uh, monopolies in the United States is a power monopoly. And Power Ledger says, if you have solar panels on your house, you should be able to sell that back to the grid and back to other people on the grid. And you should be able to control your own electricity as, a, as someone who is contributing to the electric grid. Uh, Nexus. Nexus is looking to build satellites and a blockchain to give free internet to the entire world on the blockchain. And you can go example after example after example after example, but the answer is... There are organizations in your community, I guarantee it, right now, and many of you know who they are and that they exist. These organizations are already meeting human needs in your community. They're already meeting human needs in your state. They're already meeting human needs in your county. And these organizations do a better job than the government. They gave me 10 more minutes, which is what I thought I originally had, but whatever, we're going. Um, and <laughs> thank you. Um, and these organizations do a better job than the government, and they are meeting the needs in your communities right now. I want to go through a couple more examples. Um, remember the temporary assistance for needy families, the basic welfare chart that I had up earlier, about 74% overhead? Does anybody remember that chart? Okay. Crossroads of Michigan, an organization in southeast Michigan, for every $10 you give them, $9 goes to the welfare recipient instead of $2.46 through the federal program. They run the exact same program. There's another organization in San Diego called Saved in America. Is anyone in here familiar with Saved in America? Is anyone in here a parent? One of the scariest things for a parent is that your child goes missing. 
And uh, when a child goes missing, typically, uh, a law enforcement manhunt may not find the child uh, in under three weeks. Uh, they'll spend about a million dollars or so. Well, Saved in America is an organization of former Navy SEALs, law enforcement, and private investigators who have one mission, and that is finding missing children, have found over 70 children since 2014, and an average cost to the organization of only $5,000 per child. Imagine the impact of more saved in Americas in this country. Um, anyone here go through the TSA on your way here? Anyone here like the TSA? Okay, well, but it's important. We have uh, aviation security in this country for a reason. Uh, but if you replace the TSA, say, with Covenant Aviation Security at San Francisco International Airport, they now have the lowest complaint ratio of any major airport in America at only 2.72 per 100,000 passengers, which is less than half the national average. Um, is anyone in here familiar with a little thing called the legalization of marijuana? Okay, does anybody live in a state where marijuana is legalized? You can shout, it's okay. Um, so there is a, a big push in the United States right now to legalize marijuana, but let the government, which has no experience whatsoever in regulating it, regulate it. Uh, well, there's a company in California called Steep Hill, and they put out a contest uh, for residual solvent, or for cannabis, essentially, uh, for cannabis concentrates, and they had 130 entries, and all but three of them failed the pesticide test, even after regulation in California. Um, now, of course, they kind of magically went, surprise, it wasn't really a concentrate contest, it was to see if you had uh, pesticides in your weed. But uh, the next time they ran the contest, every single one of those passed. That is effective regulation. We can continue. Uh, but the point is that when you allow people to meet human needs directly, not only do they do a better job, but they deliver the outcomes that we are looking for that can transform how we meet human needs in this country. So as a recap, why do we, the people, through nonprofits, informal groups, corporations, why do we do better? Resources follow results. We get the most out of each dollar because we, we don't want to waste it. Decentralized power and control. Incentives for quality, flexibility, reduced waste, accountability, incentives to act in our compassion. It sounds an awful lot like blockchain. So there are two reasons why, if all of these organizations exist and all of these people are out there right now, why isn't it that you've never heard of them? Why isn't it that we're using them? Why isn't it that when it comes to finding missing children, every law enforcement and agency in America turns to missing children, or turns to saved in America? Because of two reasons. Number one, they can't find them. And number two, people can't directly send the money that's supposed to go to helping people, your tax dollars, to those organizations. And instead, they're left to beg for crumbs afterward from the very people who feel like they've already given and done their part for society. Um, number one, how do we find those who do better? Well, We Do Better has uh, collected a database of over 800,000 nonprofit organizations. We know what they do. We know where they are. We know how to contact them. And this Excel spreadsheet is currently sitting on my computer at home doing nobody any good. Um, we are looking for partners right now in the blockchain space who are willing to develop and put this on the blockchain for transparency's sake and, and for a reward system, but to put it on the blockchain and say, look, we want anybody in America to be able to go to this search engine, type in their zip code and what they need, and get a list of organizations that provide that. And the only thing standing between us and that is people willing to develop that website. That's it. Number one is find those who do better. Um, and number two is uh, the universal charitable credit. Is anyone in here familiar with uh, the Arizona charitable credit? OK. Our tax dollars, from the beginning, were designed as a tool to solve social problems. That is what they're supposed to be used for. And the number two reason why these organizations that I highlighted on this screen and dozens more on our website at wedobetter.org, the reasons why these organizations are not known and they're not helping as many people as they could is because they simply do not have the money to do it. Well, in Arizona, for the past 20 years, People have been able to take 20 or 200 of their tax dollars and send it to any organization that is a nonprofit that takes care of the poor in the state of Arizona. 
In 2016, 136,000 people sent $52 million to those organizations. And those organizations are meeting needs in their community, they know their community, they're local, and they're available right now in Arizona. What we are doing today is we are taking that successful credit, and through our subsidiary, we do better action. We're saying every single person in America should be able to direct their dollars to where they are most needed and to where they are going to meet human needs. And we've developed the Universal Charitable Credit, which will allow you in your state to direct up to 500 of your tax dollars to any nonprofit organization that serves human needs. We got this introduced in California and Rhode Island this year. We're active in 17 states right now. If we can show people that the spirit of America is that when we work together across partisan lines, across political lines, and we say, when it comes to meeting human needs, we drop our ideology and we focus on what works, and we allow people to find what works and direct their funding to what works, then we can change the system of meeting human needs, decentralize the system of meeting human needs in this country, and the impact that that can make on every community, on every state, on every family, and in every home could be profound. I am Dan Johnson of We Do Better. Thank you very much.